Our politics have definitely entered a new phase for the first time in our democracy. The ANC's support dropped below 50%. This is viewed by some political commentators as uh, the beginning of the end for the ANC's grip on power, while others say the ANC can still redeem itself despite uh, the losses at the elections this November, this past November, I should say. Well, for more on this now, and in particular, the future of the ANC, I'm joined by the Northern Cape chairperson of the party who doubles up as premier of the Northern Cape, Dr. Zamani Sol, who has written a very interesting opinion piece about uh, what ails the ANC. Dr. Sol, thank you for your time. And so many adjectives have been used in this article. Some of them, uh, of course, will be attributed to you, even though you quoted a number of people who had also uh, penned some opinion pieces about uh, what actually uh, should be made of the losses suffered by the ANC. So, but what stands out for me, the, the, the description that stands out for me is that where the description that is placed on the ANC is that it is a party which suffers, quote-unquote, from a credibility crisis. Is that your characterization of the ANC in its current state? No, I th uh, good morning, Cody, and also good morning to the, to the viewers, and uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I think you are asking a very important question. Uh, which I suspect that the response to it has been concluded in the minds of many South Africans. <laughs> As the African National Congress, we do suffer a credibility crisis. Uh, that is the reason why we are sitting with some of the major challenges that we are confronted with, with an electoral support base that is abstaining and not going out to vote for their organization. So. In the article, I basically identify what I call as the reinforcing pathologies, which is the illnesses mm. which the ANC is confronted with. One is weak leadership. And obviously, when you've got weak leadership, then the organization becomes a paradise of factions. And when there's a paradise of factions, as we know how factions work, you sit with lack of accountability. There's no consequences for wrongdoing. And when there's no consequences for wrongdoing, you'll see it with the runaway corruption mm. that we are being accused of today. So these are the four reinforcing pathologies. Weak leadership, factions, lack of accountability, and that actually reinforces the high levels of corruption. Uh, so uh, there, is, there, is, there is a trust deficit, and mm -hmm. that trust deficit is because we suffer a credibility challenge. These are very, very <clears throat> honest admissions you are making here dr saul and it's always interesting how the anc when it reflects whether it be on policy or on any other matter you tend to be very honest but when it comes to doing what needs to be done to correct therefore that where there seems to be lots of challenges Implementation has been the biggest failure, perhaps, of um, the ANC-run government. What needs to be done, in your view, to solve that crisis? The only way in which we can ensure that there is effective and efficient implementation of ANC policies is strong leadership. And uh, one of the issues which I raised in the, in the opinion piece is that whilst I agree with all the other writers, I read quite a lot of articles around what actually happened on these four reinforcing pathologies. One of the biggest weakness in the movement that we are missing is management of internal squabbles. Hmm. If we are unable to manage our own internal squabbles, that overflows into government. Then we've got a party which is characterized by intense internal battles, unending. And those intense internal battles, they get actually, they, they become so penetrating, they get into government. Yeah. And as soon as they get into government, government gets factionalized, and government gets high. That in itself will impact on the capacity of the state yeah. to implement some of the policy positions that we took. 
We've been speaking for the past two years on development of the development state that we need to construct and reconstruct the development state. In order for us to be successful in doing that, with all the achievements that we've managed to make over the past few years, in order for us to succeed in our project of constructing and reconstruction in developmental state, we need political stability. Yeah. First and foremost, in the ANC, and that political stability should actually penetrate into the work of the state. Sure. As you make these honest admissions, Dr. Saul, you point out, and repeatedly now, that the ANC also suffers from a weak leadership. I would hate to personalize this, but we also cannot run away from the fact that the figurehead of the ANC and by extension in government is President Cyril Ramaphosa. Is that attribution to be placed at his doorstep, therefore? No, no, no. I, we, I, I don't think it would be correct to do that and, uh, because We've got what we call it the leadership collective. When we go to conference, we elect a leadership collective, and the helm of that leadership collective is the president. So if the leadership collective does not function properly, is bedeviled by factional battles, there is no objectivity in attending and taking decisions on issues that are confronting the organization. You can't put that squarely on the door of the, of the president. The president is but just part and parcel of the collective. But, so, Mr. Saul, let I me interrupt that, you. Let, 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 me also, let me also take it so. Okay. The, the other issue. The ANC, is, in terms of issues of leadership, is quite diversified. You've got provinces which are there. You've got regions and branches which are there. What I mean by challenges of leadership, I actually mean that we have to look into the issue of leadership holistically. Right from the branch level, do you know that a branch person today might be the regional chair tomorrow? And that is not a uh, provincial chairperson uh, the day thereafter mm. and might land up in the National Executive Committee. So the complicated structure of leadership in the ANC makes it very difficult to try and pin down the problem of leadership to an individual. It's a very sophisticated structure. All right. So the result, therefore, Dr. Saul, and it is something that you capture in your article, is that the impact of all of this paralysis, if we were to call it that, in the ANC, the result of that has been a demoralized support base. These are people who have been voting for the ANC over the years. How then do you win back their support? What is it that needs to be done? Because as you put it, the ANC is not done and out. Instead, what it needs to do is to reach out and rebuild. So how do you win back the support of the people that have forsaken you in elections gone by? The, the 2022, 2022 presents a defining moment in the history of governance of the African National Congress. What I'm saying in the article, next year we'll be having about 30 regional conferences hmm. and about eight provincial conferences. We are going to the policy conference and we are going to the national conference. And the backdrop of all of that, the backdrop of all of that is this very bad electoral performance. So what I'm actually arguing is that as members of the ANC and the service leaders of the movement, we need to reach out to each other. If we are going to operate strictly within the discipline of factions and ignore the broader picture, we are definitely going to set up the organization for failure in 2024. So what we need to be doing in 2022 with all these regional conferences which are coming is for us to debate our issues and find compromises and use 2022 as the year to consolidate the African National Congress. Mm -hmm. Use it as a platform to ensure that we've got a much stronger and cohesive organization. That is what we need to do. Sure. All right. A very interesting word. There needs to be compromises in the lead up to the elective conference of the ANC in December next year. That's my understanding of your message here.
what would you define or what would you call the most in, important compromise that needs to be made at that conference in December? Basically, there's two fronts. Uh, there's two fronts. It's policy front and leadership front. The leadership front issues, they used to be, they tend to be extremely emotive. Mm -hmm. We need to ensure that policy differences, which are there amongst ourselves, those issues get settled in an amicable way by making certain compromises. And I'm certain currently you would know if you look at the political ecosystem of the African National Congress, mm -hmm. there's effectively speaking two dominant groups, which I would call two dominant factions. There's a renewal agenda and there's what they call as the RDT. Mm -hmm. Both of them right within the ANC contesting for political space. And there's different permutation in terms of their policy perspective and how they see the ANC moving forward. Mm -hmm. So we can't have a zero-sum game between the two. We can't. The ANC does not have capacity. In our current state, we don't have capacity to manage an adverse impact of a breakup. We don't have any breakaway that will take place now. That breakaway will definitely remove the ANC from power and building. So we, we don't have capacity for that. Mm. So what needs to happen, what needs to happen is that the both groups, in the best interest of the movement, in protecting the self-interest of the African National Congress, we need to look at our policy differences and find an amicable way of settling them. But there's also another issue, which will be very much important for next year, is the issue of the election of leadership of the ANC as we move towards the 2022 20, National Conference. Yeah. We can't have a blood left. We can't have blood on the floor and expect to win elections in 2022. One of the reasons why our traditional support base don't go out and vote for the ANC, they say we're a Republic party. Mm. We're a divided party. How are they going to vote for a Republic and a divided party? That's what they ask us. So what we need to do is to ensure that there's a semblance of unity within our ranks first. We should be on a charm offensive in the Address our policy differences and also address our different leadership preferences without embarking on an all-out war in the zero-sum game. That yeah. is what we are expecting. To. <laughs> this is very interesting, Dr. Saul, because if the ANC cannot afford any breakaways at this point then it means that you really have to work extra hard at the unity project. And so the question has consistently been, how do you forge unity with people who have shown that they have no problem stealing from the public? If anything, they actually will do that with impunity. If it means the ANC must die, and so be it. So how do you achieve that? Uh, Tony, I think I, I, I am very much of the firm view that any breakaway will dislodge the ANC from power. I do not mean in breakaway within the factions which are there in the ANC. I also mean any breakaway in the form of the collapse of the tripartite alliance. If Start, if the SACP moves out of the movement or Kosato moves out of the tripartite alliance, that in itself will dislodge the ANC from power. With the state in which we are now, there's absolutely no way that we can absorb. We don't have, we don't have, we don't have the shocks to absorb that impact. Mm -hmm. But the issue is then how we prioritize our thing. Every time we speak about the building unity within the ranks of the movement, People then say, are you speaking about building unity uh, as a kind of appeasing to a corrupt individuals? Mm -hmm. The reality of the matter is, it's not egg and chicken situation. An ANC that is not united will not be able to fight corruption. In order for us to fight corruption effectively in this country, we first need... We first need a cohesive organizational machine of the African National Congress to lead that fight against corruption. Mm -hmm. There is no divided ANC. There is no divided ANC. 
There is no fragmented ANC. There is no weak ANC that can fight corruption. It's a strong and a united African National Congress that can wage a formidable fight against social ills, including corruption. Mm. So it's not an egg and chicken situation. First and foremost, we need a strong ANC to fight corruption. If the ANC is weak, we won't be able to fight corruption. Sure. If the ANC is weak, then the organization will be colonized by factions. And after factions have colonized the movement, we are definitely going to see a situation where there is lack of accountability, and that lack of accountability will ferment and incubate corruption. Yeah. All right. Let's taper down then this conversation. Leadership issues aside, there is the issue of a lack of morality, it would seem, in the ANC. And there are, there's very clear evidence of that. Many examples uh, can be made, but I want to focus the attention in your province, Dr. Saul. How do you win back the support of voters who simply decided that they're actually going to stay away and not vote for any party because they've been disappointed by the ANC. How, how do you win back their support when, as a party in the Northern Cape, you went into a coalition agreement with your eyes wide open with a leader of a political party whose mayoral candidate was convicted of rape as far back as 2008. You cannot say that you were not aware of this. No, sorry, let me just come in quickly on the issue of morality. That thing of a mayor that has been convicted of rape happened in the Western Cape, not in the Northern Cape. All right. And, uh, All right. Yeah, but, but we've, got, we've got coalition agreements with the Patriotic Alliance in the province and the clear terms of what this coalition arrangements means. Hmm. But on the issue of morality that you raised, um, we're a revolutionary movement as the, as the ANC. So what we speak about, we speak about revolutionary morality. What that revolutionary morality is, is about our attitude towards the mandate that we get from the people. And number two, it's about our attitude on how we spend the resources which are meant to improve the quality of lives of the people. I think we have adequately clarified that our attitude towards the people of South Africa is that we respect the people of South Africa and one of the issues that actually drives us is to ensure that we improve the quality of lives of all the people of this country. Mm. But also our attitude, our attitude toward the public purse, our attitude toward the public purse, I think the ANC currently in the country it's the only party, could be the only party, which is on an all-out battle against corruption. Mm. And I firmly believe that in few years to come, few months to come, the South Africans would come to realize and appreciate the kind of work that we are currently doing. The hopes are all over the place. Our courts are prosecuting cases of corruption, and there are positive convictions which are taking place. And I firmly believe that uh, the people would come to appreciate the work that we are currently doing. And we are not doing this for elections. We are doing this simply because it's morally incorrect to have people who have been elected into positions of responsibility, mm. pocketing what is meant to improve the quality of lives of the people of this country with such widespread poverty, unemployment, and high levels of inequality. Yeah. Dr. Saul, let me speak to you in your capacity as premier of uh, a province that is the Northern Cape. In fact, I'm taking full advantage here. As I speak to you, there is breaking news that um, the efficacy of uh, the, one of the vaccines, Pfizer, has dropped. And as we speak now, there is the NCCC that is meeting. And they will then, subsequent to that, be a meeting with persons like yourself who lead provinces and mayors in the, at the level of um, municipalities or metros. Are you in favor of um, the shutting down of uh, interprovincial travel during this festive period? Or is the message coming 
from the president who's going to address the nation after these meetings is, is going to basically be the emphasis on vaccinate, vaccinate, vaccinate. Uh, the quarterly labor force survey came out about two weeks back by Spence essay which actually gave a very good picture on the performance of the economy of the country. Uh, so, based on that, where you've got increased levels of unemployment, highest since 2008, and uh, increased, which comes with increased levels of poverty, and we need to pump up the economy. That's what we need to do. We need to pump up the economy in order for us to be in a position to address some of these socioeconomic challenges, which basically have been compounded right. by the advent of, of COVID. So I know there are measures that might be introduced, but one would hope that those are not measures that will hamper our efforts to ensure that we grow the economy of this country. Dr. Zamani Sol is the chairperson of the African National Congress in the Northern Cape province, also the premier of that province. Thank you very much for your time.